Welcome back. Thank you for staying with us. A former inmate of the prison believes that the full demolition of the site is to invalidate the suffering of those who once inhabited its cells. Meanwhile, another former inmate has applauded the move by government. He believes that the demolition of the site has allowed him to say good riddance to bad memories. Jacques Wooding reports. Laura Japier, also known as Jomo, has deplored the demolition of the royal jail, or Her Majesty's prison as he would have known it during his incarceration at the facility. The former inmate began his stay at the royal jail on September 7, 1977, when the Royal St. Lucia police force executed a raid on the Rastafarian community at Mount Jimmy. He admits his stay at the royal jail was unpleasant, as he and his fellow Rastafarians had their dreadlocks forcefully cut and were prevented from exercising their religious rights. But he believes the facility stood testament to this period of his life and served as an anchor to the reality of what his people endured. I went to jail there in 1979, taken from the hills as a Rastafarian for planting food and growing, and growing marijuana and be, being separated, finding my own voice and seeking my own spiritual journey. And my experience there was horrid, but I wanted it to remain so that I could tell my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren what I suffered. The evidence was the prisons, and now it's gone. It's like destroying the Colosseum or destroying Robin Island because Mandela spent years in jail there. The evidence must be there to speak, and what, what has happened there is to destroy the evidence of our suffering. Another previous inmate who spoke under conditions of anonymity described similar circumstances surrounding his stay at the royal jail. However, he says he stands with the government on this move. He believes that the facility ought to have been demolished years ago. The mashing up that you're telling me about, we have to have memories. That's why the memories not for us, guys, sir. For, for one ounce of weed. If you see things we face inside there, for one ounce of weed. i glad they mash that up, guys, sir. You're telling me about if I, the PM. I agree with the PM because so much suffering that go inside there, my brother, to brethren and family members. Yeah, infringe on the rights. Yeah, take them for years. 10, 15, 12, 5, 4 years of suffering inside there. In a, in a holding cell for 3 people, 8 people in that. As the dust begins to settle on what was once the royal jail, the history associated with this site will live on through those who share their stories of time within its walls. Jacka Wooding, Hot 7 News. Members of the government remain tight-lipped about who gave the authorization to demolish the royal jail on Saturday. Director of Implementation in the office of the Prime Minister, Nancy Charles, says if any agreement was broken with the National Trust, then they should go ahead and challenge the government. However, she says she is very satisfied with the government's efforts to ensure the needs of the people that they represent are met. Geneve Gonzag has more. Questions continue to be posed to the current administration as to who orchestrated the demolition of the Royal Jail on Saturday 23rd. Director of Implementation in the office of the Prime Minister, Nancy Charles, is yet another member of the administration who would not answer as to who gave the authorization. But she did indicate that if the St. Lucia National Trust believes there has been a violation of the agreement with the government, they are mandated to find ways to solve the issue. I think the trust is well, is well within it to write to make um, a case um, for the National Trust. That is their mandate and that is the role of the St. Lucia National Trust. Um, so I don't think that anybody will hold anything against the Trust for pursuing its role and for pursuing its mandate. Um, the Trust and the government had an agreement. I saw some um, letters being posted about. Um, the trust says this is what the agreement says, this is what we agreed to. The government says this is what the letter says and it's not legally binding. So I do not want to find myself in the middle of the government and the trust um, in terms of who's right and who's wrong. Um, the trust has a mandate to do what it has to do and the government has a mandate to do what it has to do. Um, so at the end of the day, it would be for those two entities to be able to, to, to iron it out. She indicated that she is pleased to see that efforts are being made by the government to put the welfare of police officers on the front burner as well as ensure that there is better efficiency in the judicial system. From the point of view of the government, we've been trying for a while now to ensure that we can have a place 
for a new police headquarters to provide support to our policemen and women. And we're very pleased with the new design. Some of the designs or the preliminary design have been posted about. There's been a lot of excitement. I'm sure you heard from the police as well. The police um, officers have given interviews about praising the government for ensuring that they do the right thing by the police. So um, we're all about trying to do what is best for the majority of St. Lucians. Charles says, through observation and many conversations, majority of St. Lucians are relieved that the area has been cleared and a more useful building will be occupying its space. Reporting for Hot 7 News, I am Geneve Gonzag. Captain Aaron Alexander is questioning why the government has yet to begin dialogue with boat charter operators in anticipation of the reopening of the island's borders. Alexander questions why the government has chosen to open borders to the United States of America first and says he waits with bated breath for an update on the resumption of intra-regional travel. CEO of Captain Ron Tors, Aaron Alexander, has queried the government's decision to reopen St. Lucia's borders to the United States of America for the initial resumption of tourism activity. Alexander believes it would be more beneficial to the economy if regional tourism was explored first, giving local boat operators the opportunity to resume their operations before opening international borders. I'm a bit concerned because I apply my trade mainly through the Caribbean um, islands. So regional travel is very close to my heart and very dear to my heart. So I've not heard any pronouncements as far as opening the borders to our regional neighbors, Martinique in particular. So um, I'm yet to hear anything about this. However, the declaration of opening our borders to international visitors, especially from the United States, which we all know is plagued with the coronavirus. So I'm very concerned of opening the borders, especially to the American market there right now. I think that is recipe for disaster. I think we're moving too fast and we'll pay a hefty price. So I think we should just slow down and take it easy. If we open in our borders, open our borders to regional travel because the Caribbean has widely been spared, you know, the, the brunt of the COVID virus. Minister for Tourism Dominic Fede addressed some of the concerns highlighted by Aaron Alexander. He says come the 4th of June, St. Lucia's borders will be open to all. Well, we are open to every single, um, our borders are open to every single country. But what we have said is that in the first instance, because of the availability of flights, because of the fact that the demand for travel, we see that most of the demand exists from the U.S. market. Minister Fede is adamant that the new protocols which will guide tourism activity on the island will protect St. Lucia from importing more cases of COVID-19. He says while the situation remains dynamic, the priority remains the health and safety of the nation. Following an incident at the Royal Jail site which left our camera team covered in dust, Several public figures have come forward to speak out against acts of media intimidation, particularly when investigating government projects. Following a news report where a tractor operator at the Royal Jail site was caught on camera, purposely covering a news team in debris, Chairperson of the National Trust, Alison King, has spoken out against media intimidation. She says persons should not be targeted for carrying out their jobs, particularly in the case of the media, whose role is integral to keeping the public informed. Well, I'm understanding that there was an incident between your reporter and, and persons on the site. Um, in, uh, uh, basically, an, a move of intimidation against, your, against the media. I believe the media has a right to report on this story, and they have an expectation not to be intimidated. So, I'm sorry, but perhaps it's symptomatic of what is going on in this country. National trust rights have been trampled, the media, what about your rights? These sentiments were echoed by Castries South MP Ernest Hilaire. An attempt to intimidate the press. The press covered the demolition. The press highlighted to the people of St. Lucia what was happening. And the individuals there obviously want to teach the press a lesson and to intimidate them. So they probably believe if they do that, the press will be frightened to cover stories which exposes the abuse of power. And I think that is a typical that is used. Meanwhile, former chief engineer John Peters expressed sympathy with the team who endured this treatment. He believes they should receive an apology from the Ministry of Infrastructure. I was a bit disappointed in what happened to you yesterday. 
Um, it was distasteful, I must say, to the league. That's a minor word. And um, I hope you get an apology from the Ministry of Infrastructure for what occurred. He further applauded the team for continuing their duties and documenting what had occurred. Jacko winning Hot 7 News. This is the Hot 7 TV Nightly News. We'll be back after this quick break.